Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch in British history. Over 65 years on the throne, yet hers is a reign that nearly didn't happen. I think for Princess Elizabeth, the abdication must have been catastrophic. Driven by duty. My whole life shall be devoted to your service. She's ruled over crisis and war. Our thoughts today are with those in the South Atlantic. And dramatic social and technological change. Television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. She's seen over 12 prime ministers come and go. The Queen has a very sharp mind. She's endured the breakup of the empire and the creation of her beloved Commonwealth. The Queen had an instinct of what the new Commonwealth was about. Throughout it all, she's been a steadying presence. Yet the most famous woman in the world remains mysterious. This is the inside story as told by her closest friends and advisors. I think the Queen is basically a very shy person. She's very humble, actually. She's a wonderful mimic. I mean, she's really, really funny. It's hard to imagine a world without her. She has done her job bloody well. Elizabeth, the wife, the mother, the queen. In the late 1950s, prosperity and technology was transforming the world and expanding our horizons. All over Britain, people were embracing new possibilities and moving with the times. Meanwhile, the monarchy seemed stuck in the past. My husband and I... The Queen still moved in an insular world, laden with old-fashioned tradition and formality. She needed to change. People were beginning to question, not the monarchy itself, but the way it was presented, the way it was maintained, the, 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 the form it was taking. And it needed to be sort of brought up to date. The Queen is, by instinct, conservative with a small c. She accepts that change must come, but wishes to be quite certain it's necessary before she goes along with it. The palace wrestled with the issue of how to show the Queen in a more modern light. And a solution seemed to present itself in the cutting-edge medium of television. Four years previously, the young Queen had been reluctant to let it into her coronation. But by 1957, television had become universal and its influence over our lives inescapable. We all had television and we all loved it. We discussed what was on and, uh, you know, uh, it was a completely different world over and, and it changed overnight. The Queen had little choice but to fight her natural instincts and embrace the technology. It was decided her team were it well. Happy Christmas. The Queen described it as nerve wracking, but she was in good hands and uh, she was in her own setting and they moved the furniture around a bit. It must have been quite daunting, because you don't know how you're going to react. And there's not much you can do about it if it comes out badly. The broadcast was produced by the BBC's Peter Dimmock. My father had asked the Queen if she would use a teleprompter, but she declined because she felt it was much more natural when she was speaking to the nation to speak to them directly without using one. Prince Philip was very much holding her hand in throughout all of this. The Queen was rather nervous, and Prince Philip must also have known that she was rather nervous. He stood behind the camera and made encouraging faces at her, not ridiculous faces, which encouraged her to relax and to smile. The broadcast was transmitted from Sandringham House at 3 o'clock on Christmas Day, 1957. 25 years ago, my grandfather broadcast the first of these Christmas messages. Today is another landmark, because television has made it possible for many of you to see me in your homes on Christmas Day. There was the Christmas tree and there were the corgis and there was all that sort of stuff, fine, to make uh, an atmosphere of relaxation. But the voice was always, you know, uh, uh, sort of hemmed in. Uh, there was a little sort of feeling of claustrophobia about it. One longed for it to open out, and it didn't. In the old days, the monarch led his soldiers on the battlefield, and his leadership at all times was close and personal. One can feel the strain when she's doing this broadcast. She's not sitting back and enjoying it. I cannot lead you into battle, but I can do something else. I can give you my heart. She'd got an aura of aloofness about her, which it's, I, I think is 
probably slight self-defense. She has never found communication with the public easy. It, it doesn't come naturally to her. She's not a, a, a sort of glad hatter and a, ch a natural chatter up. And so I wish you all, young and old, wherever you may be, all the fun and enjoyment and the peace of a very happy Christmas. Rather than make the Queen appear current, the broadcast had emphasized the feeling that the Queen was remote and out of touch. The palace's plan to show a more modern queen had backfired. And that wasn't all. In the same year, the queen's general manner had come under fire in a very pointed magazine article. Personality conveyed by the utterances which are put into her mouth and a recent candidate for confirmation. The article whipped up a media storm and became national news. The cutting words had been written by Lord Altrincham, a pillar of the establishment. Most of her speeches would, would greatly benefit from being more natural. All I, I, I would like to see is the Queen's own character coming through. The effect will be terrific. The effect at the moment is frankly not terrific. The magazine article caused massive outrage from royalists. Lord Altrincham became a figure of hate and was physically attacked on camera. But in society at large, a less deferential attitude towards the monarchy was emerging. If the court is wrong, or if the setup is wrong, or if the of the monarchy is wrong. You have no choice, much as you may dislike having to do it, you have no choice but to, but to criticize the boss. In the 1960s, television was emerging as a powerful tool to reach out to people, but its effect could be unpredictable, especially for a woman who was so naturally shy. It was a lesson the Queen would not forget in a hurry. The 1960s was a defining decade for Britain. It began to free itself from the shackles of conservatism and embrace the new era of individuality and freedom. The stiff and cautious Christmas broadcast had revealed the gulf between Queen and country. Happy Christmas. It was a concern thrown into stark relief by the very modern behaviour of the Queen's younger sister. Princess Margaret and her closest friends seemed to revel in the changing times. Princess Margaret was the height of fashion, the most exciting, glamorous person in the royal family without doubt. Dazzling person. <laughs> if she hadn't been a princess, she would have been on stage. We dressed her up as Brunhilde and Mae West. Well, she was a wonderful Mae West. Some of the things she did, rather boring, actually. And so it was a relief for her to um, let her hair down. The Queen was always more, of course, soberly dressed. She's a very, very serious person. She and Prince Margaret are totally different characters. Couldn't be more different, really. Nor could their choice of husbands have been more different. The Queen picked a minor royal with military experience. Princess Margaret's fiancé, on the other hand, was most irregular. Tony Armstrong Jones was a middle-class photographer. We thought there must be some mistake. Usually they married either royal people or maybe cousins people from the higher aristocracy, not just a commoner. Princess Margaret's ease in embracing the new decade made her extremely popular. Well, it was sort of beginning of the 60s when everything changed totally, made it more liberated, let's say that. That was the beginning of it all, really. Tony Armstrong Jones's modernity would prove useful to the Queen in the years to come, but in the early 1960s, Princess Margaret and her husband were a reminder of what Elizabeth could never be. Elizabeth bore the burden of being queen and restricted by royal protocol. She had a much more precarious balancing act to negotiate. Changing of times must be a challenge for any part of the establishment. God, if it gets really out of date and out of touch, but it ceases to be relevant. And in the not so distant future, it will cease to exist. A trendy monarch, I think, would be a horrifying concept for her. But a monarch completely out of touch who didn't notice the things would be as disastrous. While the Queen was considered out of touch at home, it was a different story on the global stage. The Commonwealth had always been hugely important to her. In her role as its head, the Queen was unhindered by centuries of tradition and protocol. Here she found it easier to focus on the future rather than the past. The Queen has always been at the progressive, encouraging edge of the modern Commonwealth as a voluntary association, in sharp contrast 
rather more outdated attitudes of some in the British political scene. Including her Prime Minister, Harold Macmillan. Harold Macmillan may have talked about the winds of change. She knew they were blowing. In 1961, the Commonwealth came under threat. The Soviet Union was trying to pick off nations to join their communist cause. And no country was more important to both sides than the leading African and Commonwealth nation of Ghana. There was considerable concern that the Soviet Union might acquire predominant influence in Ghana, which, after all, was seen as, from a British perspective, a showcase of successful transition to independence, a strong and vibrant nation under a charismatic leader who had extraordinary influence across Africa. The Queen's priority was to visit Ghana in person. There, she could exert her own form of soft power over its leader, President Kwame Nkrumah, to make sure he stayed within her beloved Commonwealth and didn't join the Soviet cause. Sonny Ramphill was Commonwealth Secretary General. The Queen had an instinct, a real understanding of what the new Commonwealth was about. She wanted to be a, a real part of the Commonwealth. To do that, you had to be seen, you had to mix, you had to mingle. But just weeks before the Queen's visit, violent opposition and unrest was brewing in Ghana. The Queen was due, and the idea was to prevent her coming and to say that the country was unstable. He was adamant she must go. Macmillan wrote in his diary at the time, she is impatient of the attitude towards her to treat her as a woman, a film star or mascot. She has indeed the heart and stomach of a man. She loves her duty and means to be a queen and not a puppet. The queen's determination forced the government to concede. The whole of Ghana was lit by her coming. On November the 9th, 1961, the Queen arrived in Ghana. 50,000 Ghanaians were at the airport, led by President Nkrumah. There was, a, of course, the Ghana army. Put up an impressive parade. It was big. Up to that point, she'd been a mythical figure to me. My father was invited to the reception of the Queen in the original capital. And the biggest crowd he'd ever seen. My father said Kwame Nkrumah himself was carrying the umbrella behind the queen. This old man they said, yes, now I see what she really is. She's not a chief. She is the chief of chiefs. That's why Nkrumah was carrying the umbrella behind her. I thought she, he put it very neatly. <laughs> Nkrumah looked up to her as a superior leader. By establishing a personal relationship with Ghana's leader, the Queen had ensured this important country remained a steadfast member of the Commonwealth, away from the Soviet Union's influence. People admired the, the, they admired the courage that is called for. Bon voyage, it's time to leave. The Queen is the mainstay of the Commonwealth. If she had not given it her wholehearted support and love, it would have wilted on the vine. Back at home, the Queen found herself ruling a country undergoing its own political upheaval. Throughout her reign, she'd held weekly audiences with her prime ministers, and so far they'd been conservative and aristocratic. Then, in 1964, after 13 years of Tory rule, Harold Wilson had led the Labour Party to victory. Her new prime minister was a socialist, a Yorkshireman from an ordinary middle-class family. How would the Queen fare with her first Labour Prime Minister? They had a good deal in common, and I think that while it began with him being quite shy, indeed he asked if he could bring his family, his two sons, with him when he was first appointed as Prime Minister to the actual ceremony. Far that from that being a drawback, they were grown up. Um, it was an advantage. The Queen has always loved family. And that meant that Harold and she had an immediate basis for, as it were, having a relationship of additional 20 minutes, which is all you get if you're an unpopular Prime Minister with the Queen, actually moved towards nearly an hour. And both the Queen and the Prime Minister hugely valued that. My father turned up on one occasion uh, for an audience and found that the Queen was with the very young Prince Edward and was teaching him how to rub his chest and pat his head at the same time. So my father was brought in on the exercise uh, and was asked to join in. 
The Queen is well known to speak in a fairly direct way. She can be quite down to earth in the way she speaks. Harold was also quite a direct man who spoke the language of where he came from, which was Yorkshire, and that was another bond. Harold Wilson was able to provide the Queen with a useful insight into her people and her country. I think the Queen found it very interesting that my father had come from a, a much more normal background than some of his predecessors as Prime Minister. And I think the Queen found it useful uh, to talk to him about how normal people, ordinary people, lived. The Queen enjoyed Wilson's company, despite their social differences. Every autumn, the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh invite the Prime Minister of the day up to Balmoral for a weekend. The Queen drove my parents around herself, uh, where they went in and they had a nice informal cup of tea with, with the Queen, uh, brewing the tea, and both uh, the Queen and my mother are doing the washing up afterwards. Once when Harold Wilson was staying at Balmoral, they were on the moor together and the rain came down and they got soaked and they were photographed. And the Queen gave him a photograph showing the two of them soaked on a moor together. And he loved it, he treasured it, he put it in his wallet and he, he carried it around with him until he died. This close relationship with Wilson had a growing influence on the Queen and it helped her in the process of developing a more modern monarchy. He always spoke of the Queen with great respect, but also in terms that were human. He was a key figure in his relationship with the Queen in the gradual evolution of the monarchy into what one might call a democratic head of state, which the Queen has very carefully been, regardless of the party of the person who happens to be a prime minister. The Queen was taking steps in the struggle to become modern. The close personal relationship she built with leaders both at home and abroad helped her keep up with the changing times. And these relationships would be particularly important when the Queen's most trusted mentor passed away. As the 1960s progressed, the Queen distanced herself from being the traditional, untouchable sovereign. She started to emerge as a fairer and more approachable monarch. Nowhere was this more evident than at the funeral of wartime hero Sir Winston Churchill. He had been her first Prime Minister, her mentor and her friend. Churchill, Knight of the Garter, Order of Merit, Companion of Honour. The coffin is borne by a bearer party from the Brigade of Guards. With the Royal Air Force escort, it will now be drawn by a Royal Naval gun crew to St Paul's. Sir Nicholas Soames, Churchill's grandson, was at the funeral. My grandfather unreservedly worshipped. He loved the Queen. He really loved her. He'd been a figure in her life since she was a child, since she was a very small child, all her life, really. And then he was her first Prime Minister. The procession starts when Big Ben strikes quarter to ten. I was 16. I walked in the procession with my father and my younger brother, Jeremy. You see the male members of the family walking, small, sad. The Queen was obviously very sad and very moved by his death and also a tremendous reminder of her father and what they'd been through together in the war. It was the end of an era. This funeral was a very special funeral. It was a state funeral, and the leaders from all over the world came. State funerals are usually only staged for monarchs, so one for the Prime Minister would be a rare chance for the Queen to publicly pay her respects. Yes, it was a strange sensation. He's gone. Something has stopped. Anthony Mather was head of the bearer party that carried Churchill's coffin. The crowds were ten deep on the pavements, and the same around the courtyard here in front of St Paul's. The President of France, among the monarchs and other heads of state, representatives of over a hundred countries of many races and many creeds. The heads of state and members of foreign royal families were here again in, in advance. Churchill served the British crown during the reigns of six monarchs. The close bond between the royal family and their most faithful servant is at the very heart of this ceremony today. The Queen will normally arrive last at any event and will usually leave first. This occasion, it was different. She arrived before the coffin. 
and before the Churchill family, and indeed left after both of them. The Queen had made the decision to put her royal privilege aside and bestowed the honor of arriving last to Churchill's family and his coffin. The Queen waives her right to be the last to enter. This privilege is accorded to the Churchill family. It is absent to anyone. So for her to arrive before the coffin was, uh, before my grandfather, was in itself, I think, a beautiful and very touching gesture. Churchill's funeral had shown the Queen could dispense with royal protocols on special occasions. Yet some traditions the Queen held on to more tightly, and she could be formidable in her protection of them. Even the hump postage stamp. When anti-monarchist Tony Benn became Postmaster General, he launched an appeal for a new set of stamp designs. It was an exciting prospect for young designers of the time, like David Gentleman. I wrote saying that they should have more interesting subjects and also that um, they should have no Queen's head. I already discovered that fitting the Queen's head on was a really ticklish problem. It would be better left off. The Queen's head on stamps, which some of the designers objected to because it took up so much of the space of the stamp for their own art to be pushed into the corners, they pressed Tony Benn when he became Postmaster General as a well-known radical and a well-known Republican radical into changing the design of the stamps. I'd been commissioned to do a set of stamps for the anniversary of the Battle of Britain. The key thing about this is that only one of them has the Queen's head on it. When the post office heard about it, it was absolutely aghast. Yet Tony Benn wasn't deterred. He was sure he could persuade the Queen to break this 120-year-old tradition. Tony Benn was going to have an audience with the Queen anyway about stamps in general. And he took my designs along with him. Normally a postmaster general would get five minutes, shake hands, show the stamps and disappear. But I took uh, the gentleman album with me and uh, she was on a chair and I stood, sat on the floor, stood on the floor and I opened this and, and she'd never seen them before, of course. The Queen genuinely rather liked Tony Benn. He's a very attractive character. But I think she undoubtedly felt that he was a somewhat dangerous one, a slightly maverick figure, and um, viewed with some suspicion any idea which he was identified with. She looked respectfully at the designs he put that uh, Tony Benn spread out all over the floor around her because he was relieved to discover that the Queen was quite happy with the idea of reading the designs from off the floor and not from a carefully arranged portfolio. And so he, he was very happy. He left the palace in a euphoric state of mind, thinking that he had won this great battle. Well, he hadn't. So I said, oh, thank you so much. He'd leave the album. I said, I don't think I will. So I took it away. The tap and he told me it couldn't be done. Tony Benn had seriously underestimated the Queen's readiness to change this particular tradition. In a very quiet way, the palace understood that this was very fundamental, that that constant reiteration of our being a monarchy, which you get again and again every time you stick a stamp on, was something that was really very crucial. And they were determined not to yield. But the Queen, as the person who actually saw her minister, in this case, Tony Benn, was not prepared to be put in a position of saying no to an elected government. What then happened brilliantly, I think, was a very clever compromise. The silhouette of the Queen's face, or the Queen's profile, which now appears on all our stamps, sometimes in black, sometimes in gold, but always there, very small, but clearly present. Since then, the design of British has been fantastic. The Queen understood the importance of royal symbols, yet her role wasn't only symbolic. As an increasingly modern Queen, there were times when a more personal approach was needed, never more so than during a national disaster. Death is no stranger to the mining communities of They've had to make a place for it in their philosophy. But a disaster such as this is beyond any limits of experience or acceptance. At 9.15 a.m. on the morning of the 21st of October 1966, the Welsh mining village of Aberfan suffered a terrible tragedy. Then 23 years old, medical student Mansell Aylward was one of the first on the scene. I arrived in Aberfan just before 10 o'clock. All I could see was these huge 
waves of what looked like lava. You know, when you see a volcano erupting and there's slow, but not hot, cold stuff coming down the side of the mountain with, with, with large stones in the middle. A catastrophic landslide had destroyed the village and engulfed the school. Mansell's own relatives were among those they hoped to find alive. They'd be digging and somebody would blow a whistle or shout and everything would stop. And there'd be silence. We were waiting to see if we could hear anything. A shout went out that they'd made a cavity into one of the classrooms. So I got in and we expected, therefore, we would find people who are alive. Um, but uh, when I got in there, that was the, the, the thing that I, affected me for a long, long time afterwards, you know. I still feel that. <sighs> Rows of dead children sitting in the decks, desks. I don't want to go into any great detail because I know, and to make matters more emotional, their teacher was in front of them, dead, with his arms out, you know, trying to protect them. Still kept on as if, you know, we were still going to try and find people alive, and uh, didn't happen. 116 children and 28 adults died. The whole country was in shock. Prince Philip visited Aberfan the following day, but there was a feeling that the Queen's presence was needed. The Queen's closest advisers and friends remember she had felt incredibly torn. The Queen's motives were absolutely the best. She did not want to go there and distract the attention of those who were still trying to find living children under this awful mudslide. There's nobody doubts how she would be feeling. Or... And if you were, you'd lost a child and she suddenly appeared, you were... <laughs> You wouldn't appreciate it really, would you? I don't think I would anyway. The Queen was also struggling to manage her own emotions. She seems in some way to feel things too strongly, as if she... and she'd rather run away from it. If you're Queen, you have to be able to contain yourself. I mean, we can all burst into tears whenever we feel like it, however embarrassing it is, but that's something they simply cannot do. Is that inherent in her nature? Is it something she has cultivated along with the stiff upper lip? We know that she has talked to friends about her words being inadequate in a really tragic situation like that. It must be impossible. I don't know how they do it, frankly, because they have emotions like we all do. It must be very, very hard. Eight days after the disaster, the Queen visited the destroyed village. Mansell's cousin had died in the school, and he had just attended the funeral. She arrived in the car, uh, and the people were just, you know, they weren't in the streets in the sense of, you know, they were just there, and the, and the rubble was still there, and the damage was still there. I was very near. She looked um, very sombre and sobre. Aloof, perhaps, to some extent. As she moved along, um, there was this young girl who presented her with, um, with flowers. It seemed to me that her demeanour changed. When she saw that little girl and she took the flowers, even though it was perhaps only a matter of seconds, she looked very, very distressed. There were occasions in which she shed tears in public. I'd only seen films of the Queen, but I'd not seen her or any member of the royal family really then uh, show any anything at all other than stoic stiff upper lip. She was as touched as anyone else that I'd seen uh, in those few days. I think she felt in hindsight that she might have gone there a little earlier. It was a sort of lesson for us all that you have the need to show sympathy and to be there on the spot, which I think people craved from her. Showing her human side at Aberfan had made the Queen seem less remote. 
more open monarchy was going to be the way forward. Although the Queen had shown that on occasion she could connect with her people, her public image still remained largely formal and conservative. It was an impression her advisers became determined to change. And by the late 1960s, it became clear to most of them that their most powerful tool would be the press. Well, Richard Colville was the uh, first press secretary that the Queen had. And um, I think it's probably true to say that he and the press didn't always all together get on. <laughs> In fact, we always used to call him the abominable no-man because he said no to everything that was suggested. He saw his job, I think, as keeping the media at bay a bit on behalf of the Queen. This was not really good at a time when things were changing in society. The monarchy is like justice. It's not only got to be done, it's to be seen to be done. In 1968, the Queen replaced Commander Colville with an Australian, William Heseltine, a risk taker who would transform the Queen's image. Well, thank you very much. That's a flattering sort of thing to say. I was a little bit more sympathetic to the media and their wish to know a little bit more about the Queen and Prince Philip as people. It was certainly my own feeling that there was room to move a little bit more towards the idea of access and the presentation of the, of the Queen and members of her family as warm human beings. Heseltine proposed the Queen be subject of observational documentary. It was considered a radical idea. For the first time ever, the private life of the sovereign would be documented and shared with the country. Do you wish we haven't let the puppy die first? Yes, try. Oh. Yes. Try, 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 try. We must. Mummy, where are my puppy? Well, we'll see if she's uh, allowed out in the snow. Cameraman Peter Bartlett filmed the off-duty queen and her family for almost a year. Right from the start, there were absolutely no restrictions, no ever told me to say that's you're too close come away don't stand there don't do this she got used to me being around with the camera much quicker than she got used to the idea of there being a live microphone up until then everything that the queen spoke was scripted and their big ears and their big paws mm, let me be chubby about this except you are making it very old mess me jacket don't you be I don't think Prince Philip liked it very much. He, he approved, in theory, of the project, but when it came to the actual experience of having these people about him, he was um, a little impatient about it. Hi. But the Queen was wonderful about it. We filmed all sorts of things. One of them was the Queen taking Prince Edward into the village in Balmoral to buy an ice cream. We got into the shop, got the ice cream, but the Queen doesn't carry any money. I'm here to tell you, she still owes me half a crown. These were real, living, breathing human beings, and they were a family. And that's something we saw time and time and time again. It was one of the most fascinating things I've ever done. It showed that they were not only nice people, but they were not very different from ordinary people. <laughs> It was a great success for the public, and really things after that could not go back to what they had been. But the documentary was not a great success with the old guard of royalists. With monarchs, you want to feel there, there, there's, there's a mystique, there's a mystery, there's something above all that, you know. And I don't necessarily want to see them barbecuing sausages. Uh, by the, uh, you know, or flicking away mosquitoes. Um, that's, that's not what monarchs do. I mean, I know they do, but if you see what I mean, they don't. And uh, so I was really against the film, and I don't think it was a good idea. And looking back on it, I still don't think it was a good idea. I was never allowed to forget it. <laughs> um, I, there were three private secretaries who were senior to me in the royal household. And I think to a man, they were very wary of what was going on and, and um, <laughs> pulled the reins in on me from time to time. <laughs> I think he really knows better than anybody. The documentary was never aired again at the palace's request and the doors to the Queen's private life were firmly shut. Right. Just hang out on the program. Anybody else have any characters? Later that same year, Elizabeth would try a different approach, one which would ensure a more accessible Queen but retain an element of mystique. A style that embraced modernity, but didn't dispose of all royal tradition. And it would be put to the 
centuries ago, when Edward I said at Carnarvon, I give to you a prince. The investiture was a really extraordinary uh, occasion in 1969. And it was a sort of strange pseudo-medieval ceremony. A descendant of the blood of the ancient Welsh dynasties, even of the great Llewellyn. Princess Margaret's husband, now Lord Snowden, was responsible for modernising this archaic event. Lord Snowden, constable of Carnarvon Castle, offers the key. And Dame Gillian's husband was the Garter King of Arms, organising the ceremonial elements. Lord Snowden invented a new uniform for himself. It was green. He was quite a small man, and it, he came to be known rather unkindly as the little green elf. Full television coverage would be critical to ensure people felt a part of the ceremony. The ceremony was designed for television. The canopy was of, on the dais was transparent so that the cameras could see through if they needed to. The design of the ceremonial garb was modern and cutting edge, including the coronet. Lord Snowden wanted something that was different and younger and sparkier, and so this crown has got spikes sticking up, and it just isn't, it's just different. I've never seen it worn again. I don't know if it ever will be. <laughs> the coronet for sovereignty. It was a very innovative, modern design and didn't really relate to any other coronet that had been made before. The coronet itself was designed by Louis Osman. The rumour was that there was uh, a ping-pong ball inside um, the orb on the Prince of Wales coronet. I know it's absolutely true. There is a ping-pong ball inside the coronet. When you peeled away the gold, you could see the name Helix actually on the gold and the ping-pong ball, which sort of great hilarity. I think it's absolutely lovely. It's sort of a reflection of the 1960s where anything goes. The ceremony was watched by 500 million people worldwide. The public, they always enjoy these royal flummeries, you know. It's quite fun. They liked it. In a way, it was important that the royals did that because it did make ordinary people feel part of something bigger than themselves. And what does this all mean? Is it just an out-of-date, meaningless formality? Or has something important happened? It was wonderful. It was exciting, it was stimulating, it was fun, and it was a mixture of the old world and the new. Still at Carnarvon, it has been an impressive and a moving day. Success. The investiture was a victory. I thought it was wonderful. It also brought out the great romance of Wales. It did an immense amount of good to the monarchy, and it was a tremendous success. In the 1970s, Britain was going through tough times. The winter of our discontent. The days of the empire were long over. Even the gravediggers went on strike. And Britain was no longer the global superpower. We were just one of many. I think people were getting to the stage of feeling a failure after having been such a great power in their own right. The Queen would have to play a part in leading the country through this turmoil and help establish a new, more positive Britain. But as she approached 50, her popularity was waning. The problem for a monarch is that everyone likes a very young, glamorous monarch. Everyone likes a very old, supposedly wise monarch. But there's a period in between in which people get rather bored of the monarchy. But in the 1970s, being glamorous was not the Queen's priority. It was to provide the country with a sense of stability. She would start in 1972 by showing her support for Britain's entry into the European community with a visit to France. From Paris, it was Anton Cordial all the way of the fake visit by Her Majesty the Queen and Duke of Edinburgh. To the European common market just around the corner, the tour should cement our trade and friendship even more. Yet throughout her five-day visit to Paris, the Queen had another, more personal matter on her mind. Her uncle, the Duke of Windsor, was dying from throat cancer. Confined to his home in Paris, he was hooked up to drips and bedbound. The Queen would visit the Windsor's home to say a final goodbye. But first, she had to make small talk with the woman reviled by many in her family. She called in and had tea with the Duchess of Windsor. The dogs jumped up, which uh, 
and rather annoyed the Queen because the Queen doesn't like badly behaved dogs. And they talked about anything and everything except the one thing that was on everybody's minds, the poor man dying in his room upstairs. Riddled with cancer, the Duke's strength was fading. The Queen went up to see the Duke of Windsor. With great difficulty, he rose from the chair to give his, his bow, because after all, she was his queen now, as well as his niece. And it meant a great deal to him that she paid him this final courtesy. The Queen made as many reconciliations with the Duke as she possibly could under the very difficult circumstances. Ten days after the Queen's visit, the man who almost destroyed the monarchy died. It was the end of one of the most difficult chapters in royal history. The RAF flight from France. A VC-10 brings the Duke of Windsor's body. Two days later, Wallace, the Duchess of Windsor, arrived in a frail state in London for the funeral. Her presence would have to be managed with extreme care. The American divorcee had been the reason the Duke had abdicated 36 years ago, leaving the Queen's ill-prepared father to take over as King. Elizabeth's mother had never forgiven either the Duke or the Duchess. There was always going to be a bit of um, ill feeling, I think, as far as the as Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother, was concerned. It suited her very well, I think, to consider that the Duchess of Windsor had sort of stolen the king and that she was a very evil woman. Overcome with grief and all alone, the Duchess was in a fragile state and the Queen stepped in to ease the situation. It wasn't, of course, easy because they didn't really know her and the Duchess was very nervous of the whole business of coming over. She was so kind. She is so kind. She looked after her and had a stay with her at Buckingham Palace and made sure that she was, she was happy and comfortable and had the food she wanted and things like that. Hugo Vickers was amongst the mourners at the Duke's funeral, where the Duchess was extremely distressed. The Queen was very solicitous to the Duchess and helped her find her place in the hymn book and so forth, uh, and, and generally looked after her during the service. She made it as easy as possible. More than that, the Queen soothed all tensions and brought her mother and the Duchess together. When the Duke of Windsor was being buried, the royal family went down with the Duchess of Windsor, and Queen Mother came as well. She wasn't meant to originally, but she decided to come, which was a huge, huge reconciliation. The Queen went even further and asked the Duchess for her final wish. After he'd been put into his grave, the Queen asked, which side of him do you want to be buried on? On one side of the grave, there is a plane tree, and the Duchess thought, well, I was always in his shadow during my lifetime. So that would be the side for me. Also, she used to collect the leaves of the plane tree, which used to fall in her garden and place them on her dressing table. And she thought, well, no one's ever going to put flowers on my grave. So it would be nice if the leaves of the plane tree fell onto my grave. And that's the side she was buried on in 1986. The Queen had helped heal a wound that had festered in her family for decades. And this ability to lead the way through turmoil and strife would be tested over and over again throughout the 1970s. been queen for almost 20 years. She was well versed in opening buildings, meeting officials and avoiding controversy. And you think of some of the events she's had to sit through for hours on, hours on end. That takes time going. I thought when I was private secretary arranging the programmes, sometimes one ought to build in a small spontaneous disaster because she so enjoyed it when something went slightly wrong in the course of the day's event. There was an occasion in Papua New Guinea. The Queen had arrived with the usual formalities. The local MP she was dressed in PNG fashion in a few feathers and not very much else. And he got up to speak and he couldn't see his notes. What those who were seated behind him could see was that his bare and rather sweaty bottom uh, had attracted all the notes. And there they were, firmly attached to his person while he looked about for them. And that was the sort of incident that appealed to her very much. <laughs> Back in Britain, the Queen had a lot more to worry about than the odd mishap by a foreign dignitary. And whilst she navigated her way through this difficult decade with care, her husband was, unfortunately, less cautious. Queen Elizabeth 
Labour has not had a pay raise for nearly 18 years. Is that creating an awkward situation? Really? You're going to the red every next year. Yeah, I should probably have to give up Burrow Phillips and this is my go. Poor old Prince Philip. He knows what he's doing. He's not stupid. But there is something in him which simply can't resist saying something outrageous. I think it was one of Prince Philip's throwaway remarks distressed the Queen probably more than any other situation could have done. <laughs> Somebody's got to do the job. The Queen wasn't the only one upset by Prince Philip's comments. His reference to royal hardship was met by public furor. When Prince Philip comes along and says he'll have to engage in a supreme hardship of doing without his polo, it really is more than I can bear. In contrast to the rest of the country, there was a feeling that the Queen had it all. In 1971, Britain's housing was dilapidated, yet the Queen enjoyed living in a choice of five grand homes. Jobs were lost and companies went bust, while the Queen travelled the world in private jets and boats. People particularly disliked the Royal Train. Funded by the taxpayer, it was seen as an expensive luxury. Mr. Mellis, how long have you been the royal chef on the train? Over 12 years. How many trips is that? Good gracious, I couldn't tell you. I mean, this is rather a lot. <laughs> Nick Edwards shows us around the Queen's carriage, which she used until 1977. He's in charge of maintaining the royal train's high standards to this properly. Duke of Edinburgh is, is his old WH Smith road atlas to see where he's travelling on the train. And finally, we make sure the temperature is okay. The Queen likes it quite high, and the Duke of Edinburgh likes it slightly lower. And the Prince of Wales likes it very cold. The Queen's old carriage was both comfortable and functional. So we go into the coach, make sure the sleeping and bathing accommodation. So this will be the only time that we go into the Queen's accommodation just to make sure it's done correctly. Hot water bottles, fans, etc into then into the bathroom accommodation, toilet trees, making sure everything's clean and tidy, anything that's required, tissues, etc. The Royal Train was the Queen's favourite way to travel around Britain. She liked not being in too much of a hurry. And of course, if you're on the train, nobody can get at you. And for those close to her, it was an extraordinary experience. One of my own experiences of travelling uh, on the Royal Train uh, was of actually having my first and only bath on a moving train. <laughs> So there's a confession. For the public, the royal train with its custom-built carriages, dedicated staff and meticulous preparations was an indulgent luxury, which they were paying for. The people of Britain have paid for the running of the monarch's household, close family and official duties for the past 200 years. This money is called the civil list and is set at the beginning of the monarch's reign. In 1952, Parliament decided that Her Majesty should have a sum of £475,000. Since then, the cost of living index has indicated a huge increase in all costs. By the 1970s, the Queen was struggling. The civil list had been hit hard by inflation. The cost of everything in the country in, in those 20 years had gone up enormously. By 1971, the Queen's finances had reached crisis point. And to continue in her role as head of state, she reluctantly went to Parliament to ask for an increase to the civil list. Neither the palace nor the government liked going back to Parliament for more money for the civil list. Um, it didn't go down well. A cross-party select committee was set up to look into the matter. Well, it was a political hot potato. It was a thing that needed to be uh, shifted through uh, quite gently. Some MPs were appalled and described the request as the most insensitive and brazen pay claim made in the last 200 years. That ought to be a cost-benefit analysis of the royal family expenditure on income. Since a civil list was a civil list, it's always been for the duration of the reign, however long. Thank you both very much. The inquiry would become the biggest investigation into the value of the monarchy of the Queen's entire reign. A 264-page report was compiled. The public needed to be convinced, public duties that the Queen performed in the national interest and not private tripperies. And so, without any fuss or bother, the palace showed them the books, as it were. How much was spent on entertaining visiting heads of state? How much was spent on travelling around Britain? All the sorts of things that you see being done. Everyday expenses, you might say, absolutely essential. 
including £1,455 on newspapers and £7,217 on laundry. There had never been such detailed exposure of the way in which money provided under the civil list was used. This really was a groundbreaking exercise. After six months of deliberation, Parliament agreed to increase the civil list to £980,000. But not before questioning whether the Queen's mother, husband, daughter, cousin and sister also gave value for money. One person in particular was hotly debated. Some people criticised Princess Margaret and uh, felt that the money, that taxpayers' money that went, was more than was necessary for her public duties. The suggestion that Margaret stop receiving funds sent shockwaves through the family. The idea of Princess Margaret, say, the Queen's own sister, getting struck off the civil list was certainly totally unacceptable to the Queen and a Louis XIV moment when she just stamped her foot and said, Margaret's my sister. No, the Queen stuck by her. The Queen won this battle and Margaret remained on the civil list. Elizabeth was fiercely protective of her younger sister. And that protective attitude was about to be called on again, when Margaret became the prime target of the press. In the 60s, the readers would want total respect and gushiness about how radiant the Queen was looking. And the only thing that the press secretary did was hand out descriptions of what the Queen was wearing, as if we were blind. But by the 1970s, the old respectful relationship between the newspapers and the royal family was over. The hard times of the early 70s extended to Fleet Street. The newspapers were fighting each other for survival. It was dog eat dog. And into this situation comes Rupert Murdoch. Murdoch had bought the Sun newspaper and led the way in setting the tone of the new style of tabloid press. Murdoch, of course, changed everything. And one of the things that he specialised in was being cheeky to the royals. And everybody loves gossip. He just saw how royal stories could sell newspapers. Just as he exposed women on page three. Away. The new hunger for scandal and gossip served only to exacerbate a difficult situation in Princess Margaret's private life. Ten years after she had married photographer Lord Snowden, their relationship was on the rocks, and Fleet Street was awash with tales of extramarital affairs. People knew all about the rumours of her having affairs, and it was partly because uh, she looked like a woman who'd be having affairs. But there is always time. What did she say about the rumours? We didn't talk about that Not at all. Well, I think it was very awkward for the Queen. She realised that Princess Margaret's marriage was pretty difficult. And so she sort of stepped in. She knew she was going to stay with her a lot and did our best to make it better for Princess Margaret, I think. The situation became increasingly difficult when Lady Glen Connor and her husband introduced Margaret to a man 17 years her junior, Roddy Llewellyn. I remember being on the doorstep when Colin drove back and Princess Margaret and Roddy were sitting in the back seat, more or less holding hands, and I thought, heavens, what have we done? Roddy Llewellyn was a nice, dim gardener, but he came from quite a, a good family. Um, <laughs> anyway, she, she was having it off with him. In an effort to keep their affair under wraps, Margaret and Roddy spent time together on the private Caribbean island of Mustique. It was a boat, let's say. You know, she adored it and went there whenever she could. It was like a house party, and there was always some exciting thing going on. She was centre of attention there. There were quite a lot of young men hanging about. But by the mid-1970s, a new breed of Murdoch-inspired photographer found a way onto the island. Suddenly, it's paparazzi, it's celebrity culture, and in the celebrity culture, the pop stars and the actresses, the royal family are the biggest game. All. So what you really want if you're a newspaper editor is you really want a picture of a royal in a compromising position because that is going to triple, quadruple your circulation. On February the 22nd, 1976, the News of the World published a picture of Princess Margaret cavorting with Roddy Llewellyn. This photograph of her with a younger man on a Caribbean island soaking up the sun apparently as lovers at a time when 
the rest of, of Britain is suffering three-day weeks and that sort of thing. It was a game-changing moment. It did produce a rather oppressed frenzy, as it were. And I think that must have been very difficult for them. What's the, can you tell me what happened there? What can you say about what happened? It was terrible, really. She didn't have an easy life. It may have been part of their own fault, but you know what I mean. Less than a month later, the palace announced... Because it was quite unusual, in a way, for the times we lived in then. Princess Margaret's love life had been a matter of distress for the royal family right back to the 50s. The royals did not get divorced. The royals were perfect. The royals didn't have marital problems. They were the fairy tale. That was the idea. And affairs and divorces and uh, being exposed, scandal in the newspapers, it pretty much brought them down to everyone else's level. The fact that there was a divorce did change a lot of things, because if you remember, People who were divorced weren't allowed to, you know, go to the garden party. They weren't allowed into various bits of royal casket. You weren't allowed to divorcee near the, the royals. <laughs> well, of course, when the Queen's sister divorces, so they had to forget about all that. It changed a lot of protocol. Divorce from the early years has been the bugbear of, of, of the Queen's reign from the abdication through Margaret. Yet the Queen was torn. Margaret's happiness was also very important to her. It was difficult for the Queen, and I felt rather guilty always, having introduced God to Princess Margaret. But after Princess Margaret's funeral, the Queen, she said, I would just like to say, Anna, it was rather difficult moments, but I thank you so much uh, introducing Princess Margaret to Roddy because he made her really happy. Margaret's love life shattered the image of a stable and loyal royal family combined with the outcry over the Queen's finances, was making this the Queen's rockiest decade yet. In the 1970s, Britain was in desperate need of stability, which the monarchy was struggling to provide. Now as the decade progressed, Queen Elizabeth turned her mind to offering the country a more certain future, and she hoped that her heir, Prince Charles, could help. The solution that the royals, that the politicians, that the courtiers have to all the royal problems, to all the problems of the 70s, is that Charles needs to get married. And this is about stability, it's about keeping generations going. Well, Prince Charles had made himself a bit of a hostage to fortune because he had speculated that about 30 would be quite a good, a good time to be getting married. The Queen was anxious about who he was going to marry. And so the search began to find Charles a suitable wife. Where's um, a mother's concern is that they're going to pick somebody who's going to make them happy or to make each other happy. Yet Elizabeth wasn't only a mother. She was the queen. She would want the future king to show restraint and not develop the womanizing reputation that had dogged both her uncle and great-grandfather. As a man about town, a playboy, lots of girlfriends, having girls, not settling down. Because everyone knew that the prince was incredibly sought after. He was very marriageable. Any of girls would be keen to go out with him. It wasn't always easy for Charles, partly because his great uncle and mentor was very specific about the kind of woman Charles should be courting. Lord Knight Batten was a very mischievous man. He would set up plots to get Charles to marry who Lord Knight Batten wanted. He did have this problem that she had to be a virgin. You couldn't have the next princess of Wales to have had any sexual experience whatsoever. And I said to Mount Patton, you're mad. This is the 70s. There cannot be a virgin in the land. I said, honestly, I mean, are you going to have tests? The palace fear was that if she wasn't a virgin, there would be forever scores of ex-lovers, you know, coming out and generally making it all rather sad and tacky. And virginity wasn't the only problem in finding Charles a wife. Some suitable girls, they didn't want to be queen. They had an experience of life as Charles's girlfriend, being followed by the press, their outfits being talked about, their appearance being criticised, and they thought, actually, I don't want this for myself. The new media had created an insatiable hunger for gossip, and interest 
Prince Charles's love life became a global phenomenon. Almost every working day of the five years I was at the palace, we had a call from somebody asking us who is Prince Charles going to marry, telling us would we comment on so-and-so. There was this absolutely unending interest. There's obviously going to be particular attention to the heir to the throne. Wherever he went, whatever he did, there's going to be a camera or somebody to pick up something he might have said or going to somebody, did he say this? There's always a picture of him now. And even in Australia, when he came out of the sea, there was a girl chasing him and trying to kiss him. It never stopped. Much to the palace's disappointment, the 1970s came and went without even an engagement. Not least because Charles was prone to falling for women that he legally could not wed. He said to the Queen Mother one day, he said, you know, Granny, it's awful. I keep falling in love with Roman Catholics. <laughs> and she said, oh, darling, do be careful. <laughs> Unable to use her heir's marriage to provide Britain with a more certain future, the Queen that involved avoiding at all costs getting embroiled in the country's political struggle. They've searched the cellars and every opening of Parliament since the Guy Fawkes plot of 1605. Keeping the Queen out of politics in the 1970s was a job undertaken by Martin Chartres, her private secretary. His counterpart at number 10, Robert Armstrong, remembers. Martin Chartres had been at her side for a long time. He was devoted to the Queen. He used to say he was in love with her, but I think that was an exaggeration. But, but he was clearly very fond of her, and I think... She had a trust in him and an affection for him, which was probably unique. We had become really very good friends. Each of us understood what our role was, protecting the Queen's interest, trying to make sure that she was not drawn in politically. The risk was that she might be called on to use her reserve powers, which allowed her to personally dissolve Parliament and appoint Prime Ministers. But it's the form of power, rather like a nuclear weapon, that never, ever do you really want to use it? The Queen preferred to avoid making political decisions and instead followed the recommendations of her Prime Ministers and the democratic will of her people. And that gives her the opportunity of separating in the public view of not getting involved, if you want, in the Parliament's debate of the day. In the back of her mind was the knowledge that her ancestors had once overstepped the mark and suffered the consequences. The Queen is the first to know that while she reigns, she doesn't rule. At the moment, any sovereign started to try and throw his or her weight about in that sense. That would be the end of the monarchy. The Queen's insistence on political impartiality was fundamental to the popularity and survival of the monarchy in Britain. In delivering her gracious speech from the throne, the Queen is taking no part in politics. The speech is prepared for her by the incoming government. Yet in Australia, where she was also Queen, her representative did use the Crown's power to intervene in politics. This very nearly brought the Queen's sovereignty of Australia to a dramatic end. I knew it was a coup, and it really was a coup. The most dramatic and lethal event in Australia's political history. In 1975, Australia faced a constitutional crisis. Never seen you fellas up so early. There was a political deadlock in its two houses of parliament. Seriously expect Mr Whitlam to give ground on this today. Well, uh, we'll find out, won't we? Government funds for all public services had been blocked. With neither house prepared to surrender, the country was being held to ransom. It was over policy, it was over politics, it was over culture, and it was over the sort of country Australia was to be. Old Australia and the new Australia. While politicians battled to find a way out of the mess, Governor General John Kerr, the Queen's representative in Australia, was losing faith in the Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam. Kerr hatched a bold and audacious intervention. Sir so John Kerr is a negatist. In my view, he had trouble written all over him. And I personally would never have appointed him to be Governor General. This is the Prime Minister's office. Mid-morning on the 11th of November 1975, Gough Whitlam, sitting at that desk, rang Government House, spoke to the Governor General, Sir John Kerr, informed the Governor General that he wanted an appointment to resolve the crisis. 
Meanwhile, on the other side of the lake, at Government House, Kerr's plans have reached a very advanced stage to sack the Prime Minister. The documents are all being prepared. This is a constitutional ambush. I was with Gough Whitlam and Kerr the last time they saw each other in a happy way, and they were having a great old time, guff roaring and laughing. There was no warning for Whitlam. Kerr broke all the conventions. Whitlam goes to Government House. Kerr, on the table in the study, has face down the dismissal letter. Kerr hands Whitlam the letter and gives Whitlam the greatest shock of his political life, the body blow that terminates his prime ministership. Not at the hands of the people, but at the hands of the Governor General through use of the Crown's powers. Kerr had personally sacked Whitlam and appointed a man he believed could solve the crisis, opposition leader Malcolm Fraser. It was as unthinkable as the Queen firing the British Prime Minister on the spot. Paul Keating was the youngest member of Gough Whitlam's cabinet at the time. And I said to Whitlam, we should lock Kerr up. We should arrest him and lock him up. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor-General. A call was made to Buckingham Palace. David Smith, the Governor-General's official secretary, said, I'm ringing to tell you that the Governor-General has just dismissed Mr Whitlam as Prime Minister. Oh, I said, oh, <laughs> uh, what, a, what did you say? <laughs> he certainly gave the Queen no notice of what he was intending to do to resolve the situation until it had actually happened. Kerr's actions had been completely at odds with the Queen's desire to stay out of politics. We knew Kerr abused the powers that the Queen has suffered. For a day or two and hoped for, that a political solution of some sort might have been achieved is the matter about which I have been concerned and, and have still got the view that he might have done so. We know that in 1977, two years after the dismissal, the palace was quite happy to see Sir John Kerr retire prematurely. The consequences involving the Crown in politics were monumental. It changed the very fabric of the Australian nation. It destroyed forever the general bipartisanship and goodwill between the parties here. And, and to this day, public life in Australia is disfigured by that event. The dismissal lit the fire of republicanism. Keating never forgot it, he never forgave her, and always, close to his heart, harboured the idea of an Australian republic. The Australian Prime the, the Australian crisis proved that using the Crown's powers to meddle in politics would fundamentally threaten the Queen's position, whether in Australia or in Britain. Members of the Senate, pray be seated. It was an episode the Queen would never forget. A golden day for the Silver Jubilee. In 1935, the Queen's grandfather, George V, a jubilant year celebrating the 25th anniversary of his reign. But in 1975, as Elizabeth approached her own Silver Jubilee, Britain was still in the midst of a recession. This was not a time for lavish festivity. The feeling was that the Queen's reign should be marked by a single day of modest ritual. The Queen herself was very anxious there should not be any undue expenditure on it. Jim Callaghan, who was the Prime Minister at the time, Took the same view that, of course, there had to be some marking of it, some celebration of it, but not at uh, too great an expense. Then in 1975, the Evening Standard published a letter that turned the tide. It called for a royal jubilee festival full of fun, froth and splendour and received 250 letters of support. It's a marvellous letter, saying in practice that, uh, you know, despite everything, aren't we fortunate in having a, a, a queen and what the royal family means to this country and our history and what we should be proud of and so on and so forth. And that really sort of got people really sort of talking as to whether we might try to have a crack at pulling it together. The Silver Jubilee could be an opportunity to get Britain out of the doldrums, bring people together and unite them across their differences. Two days later, it was official. The country was going to celebrate, but not at the cost of the taxpayer. 
in those days, many of our biggest companies were headed by people who'd served in the last war and had a great feeling, obviously, for the defense of the realm and indeed, of course, for the role of the queen. So the head of a company would be sort of say immediately on the phone, and a great idea, um, we're behind you, with pleasure. And we'll send you over a check. Within about 48 hours, I realized I was on a home run. <laughs> with the funds secured, the Jubilee Committee spent the next two years planning what would be the greatest celebration of the Queen's reign. And there, in letters of fire, E to R. On the 6th of June 1977, Elizabeth braved the elements and officially launched her Silver Jubilee, lighting the first of over a hundred beacons that blazed across the country. The bonfires were a way of bringing the whole country together bit by bit by bit, with the Queen right at the centre of it. The beacons were followed by extravagant firework displays, concerts and parades. The Queen was absolutely stunned, amazed by the reception that she got throughout the country, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. She said that she had no idea that this would, ha would happen. When she smiles, it's extraordinary. She has a just amazing smile, which lifts everybody. But the real success of the Jubilee lay in the 12,000 street parties held across the country. When everything else seemed to be black and strikes and interest rates and what the world thought of us, etc. Those street parties are really quite special. I mean, we love a knees up. Every now and then, we, the country needs to have some sort of a reason for celebrating. Street parties were thrown even in the more divided communities. In 1977, Anjula Devi and her family lived on Northcote Avenue in Southall, London. We were the only Indians on the street, and it was very bizarre, a little bit frightening. We did feel a little bit isolated. Mostly we stayed in the back garden, hardly ever played in the front garden. The local community was planning a Silver Jubilee street party, but the Devi family had not been invited. On the morning, Dad decided that we were going to be involved because he loved the Queen, he really did. In fact, he had pictures of the Queen. I clearly was horrified when he told me he wanted to make um, aloo porota, which is a layered bread stuffed with a creamy mashed potato. <laughs> I wanted to have ice gems and some blessed bread, like everybody else, and fit in. And then we came out with these huge flat griddle pans, if you like, uh, and started cooking these parathas. And I just thought, no one's going to eat these, Dad. Slowly, people started to trickle over to see what was going on because they could smell something different. People started to queue up, waiting for this food. And, you know, we started to see smiles on people's faces. And then I actually quietly smiled back because I was thinking, hey, I think I could make some friends here, <laughs> you know. Once divided the community. It brought people together who, who before never stepped into our front garden and never even really spoke to us. We became a community after Queen's Jubilee. All the children started to play together. And certainly to this day, it's remarkable that the children are actually my brother's best friends now. That says a lot, doesn't it? So it changed things, and that's thanks to the Queen. The Queen stepped onto Scottish soil to begin her tour. For a whole year, the Queen attended official celebrations up and down the country and across the Commonwealth. The Queen obviously it all, the excitement, the feeling of contact. The Queen's always surprised at the amount of adulation she gets on these occasions. I really think she genuinely is. She's very humble, actually. She doesn't expect it. The square is as large as several football pitches, but it seemed all the space was needed for the enormous throng that wanted to see the Queen. The universal affection, the love that was shown to her, it was palpable, it was real. At times, it was very, very real. It was a very tough time, and a Queen Silver Jubilee it really cheered people up. It was wonderful to see that people really love her, but my goodness, she's earned it. The Silver Jubilee wasn't just about having fun. It had a profound effect on the country's consciousness. These were very difficult times, an uncertainty, and people rethinking of what life's about and what are we as a country. The one steady aspect, like a light, all that fog in that period of time was the monarchy and the Queen in particular. It, it had a steadiness, which the rest of the country didn't seem to have at that stage. It, it set the scene, the Jubilee, for people to be able to rethink and regain confidence again for the way forward. A day of happiness and success for the Queen. A day for Britain to forget her problems for a while and perhaps look at them differently tomorrow. It was nearing the end of an extremely hard decade for the Queen. 
but it ended with hope, with the coming together of her people with a common cause. Next time, the Queen and the monarchy are riding high. There's the fairy tale wedding of her son, Prince Charles. The Queen was delighted because, I mean, you know, he wasn't all that young, Prince Charles. The Queen had never been so popular until an ill advised TV project in 1987 threatened to bring the good times to an end. I tried to persuade the Queen it was such a bad idea that she ought to call it off. What did you think of it? <laughs> <laughs> this did more damage, I think, than almost anything that happened in my time. Thanks. Good hands, and uh, she was in her own setting, and they moved the furniture around a bit. It must have been quite daunting, because you don't know how you're going to react, and there's not much you can do about it if it comes out badly. The broadcast was produced by the BBC's Peter Dimmock. My father had asked the Queen if she would use a teleprompter, but she declined because she felt it was much more natural when she was speaking to the nation to speak to them directly without using one. Prince Philip was very much holding her hand in throughout all of this. The Queen was rather nervous and Prince Philip must also have known that she was rather nervous. He stood behind the camera and made encouraging faces at her, not ridiculous faces, which encouraged her to relax and to smile. The broadcast was transmitted from Sandringham House at three o'clock on Christmas Day 1957. 25 years Hello. my grandfather broadcast the